It is an honor to, <laughs> to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Deb Simkin, um, past co-chair of the Committee on Complementary and Integrative Medicine for the Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry <laughs> and um, a professor at Emory University where she teaches integrative psychiatry to residents as well as expert in neurofeedback and leader in the field, Dr. Simpkin. Let me just give the fast version of this. Uh, basically that, you know, Joel Lubar was probably one of the far forefathers of this research. And he started it by just doing two simple electrodes on the head with a ground, as usually put in the ears. And he noticed that if he decreased beta, which is more uh, associated with anxiety um, and increased theta, which is more attention, that the kids with ADHD seem to do better. Now, that's come a long way. <laughs> I don't do theta beta and probably wouldn't. Uh, there's now 19 channel Loretta neurofeedback, which is low resolution electromagnetic tomography. Uh, and basically it is using 19 channels. So the difference really here is important. Uh, if you do uh, neurofeedback with two electrodes, every frequency is underneath the, each one of those electrodes, right? But when you do a Loretta, what you're doing is you're separating out all those, those frequencies under each of those 19 channels and finding the deep source location. Now, why is that important? Well, number one, you're able to really utilize that to do a quantitative EEG. Uh, which to me is now the poor man's functional MRI. Um, but based, and it's been, it's being used now in research a lot with neurologists as well as other physicians and PhDs. But the, the added benefit there is that you can actually look at connections. You can try to either improve those connections or if they're overconnected, you can downregulate them. And so there are many more things you can do with this. Um, I don't use it as a first intervention, uh, obviously. First of all, it's expensive to do it. Um, and I personally believe if we go the complementary integrative approach or functional medicine approach first, it's more important, especially in regards to inflammation. Because if you don't get that down and people are still eating the junk food and the sugar, no matter what you do here, they're going to perpetuate some of these problems. So it's changing lifestyle as well and mindset. Um, the, the important thing though here is that you might want to know a little bit how we do it when we do it. And the first thing we do is we sit down with the patient and we put the 19 electrodes on and we do a EEG recording. Um, what we're, and we do it with eyes open and eyes closed. Um, what we then have to do is artifact it. I have to take out anything. Somebody has seizures. I'm not going to do it. Obviously I'm just going to send them to a neurologist but like eye blinks, things like that. You wanna get a clean EEG. So you take out all the artifacts. And then based on that, you take all of the data that you obtained from that patient and you compare it to a normal database. And what you're looking for is the association of symptoms, not diagnosis. And I don't like DSM, sorry. Uh, but looking for symptoms that would be located in those areas of the brain. And obviously you have to really be good at remembering all of what goes on in the brain to do that, but comparing it to a normal database and then seeing if perhaps some of the data that's associated with your symptoms is abnormal. Is it, compa is it abnormal compared to a normal database, right? Once you've obtained that information, you have the patient come back. And in one session, you may have five sessions. So you'll do a five minute neurofeedback, take a pause. Do a five minute neurofeedback, take a pause. When you're doing that, the one I loved was when I came in, I watched a race car on a track, right? Your normal frequencies will occasionally show up, right? And when they do, that car will move. And what you're trying to do is to learn what is it that you're doing that's causing those frequencies to show up so the car starts moving. And as we're watching them, we will increase the amount of time they have to hold it, right? 
And so when you've done that, you actually, after about five or six sessions, do another quantitative EEG to see if you're getting any improvement. Because if you're not, it's not worth doing it anymore, right? But if you are, then you continue. And you do those quantitative EEGs um, after three to five sessions, depends on what you're doing or who you're dealing with. Um, the other thing is, is that these sessions tend to take less time because you have so many electrodes involved. So old theta beta research uh, really took like 60 to 80 sessions. You can do something with Loretta in 20 sessions. Um, and in fact, the case that I had where I really use, utilized it was a woman who came in. Um, she was really intelligent, IQ of 140. Um, she uh, woke up one morning confabulating. And what they realized is she had a congenital cyst that had closed up. And so she had some CNS fluid uh, buildup and she had a left shift and she had to have neurosurgery. Well, it basically took out that area of the brain. And what happened after that is she came to me with like four or five different antidepressants at one time. Um, she couldn't do simple math um, problems anymore. Um, she was so depressed that she would sit in her room and if her husband was there, she wouldn't even speak, she'd text him. I mean, her, her life had changed dramatically. So I called Jill up and said, Jill, this is gonna be a difficult one. I, I really want you to work with me on this. And so what we did was we knew we didn't have any neurons in the area where the brain damage occurred and where they had to take out tissue. So what we did was try to improve the coherence, you know, what was going on around those structures and then to try to correct some of the damage that had been done by the shift to the left. She had some working memory problems with that. After 22 sessions, she was back to normal. So, you know, that says something about this. Now, the controversy with this is there's been a lot of studies on theta beta or other types with, you know, two electrodes saying it works, others saying it doesn't work. And I think the difficulty is finding a correct sham because if you have a kid looking at a TV program or whatever, they're going to get some intermittent, you know, positive neurofeedback response during that. And so I think what's happened in the past is we've had a lot of shams uh, that really made the comparisons less effective because they were definitely getting neurofeedback. And I've talked to Gene about this in his ICANN study. In fact, Joel now is taking Gene's work and he's going over it to look at the placebo, the sham, to see how many times they were getting intermittent frequency re, uh, neurofeedback to see if perhaps that's another thing that may be going on. I think, it's, I think it's still controversial because of that, but I don't know that we'll ever really be able to get really good double blind placebo controlled studies because of it if we find out that's exactly what's been going on. Um, the other thing that I really love about this, and it's interesting that we were talking about children who don't respond to, I, we're, Noshin's working with me on this, Bettina's working with me on this, Amelia's a part of our, our program as well. We're setting up a textbook now that's gonna come out in November on cognitive integrative medicine or functional medicine in child and adolescent psychiatric disorders. And I just finished the one on PTSD and it's very clear that anyone, especially under seven, who's had chronic sexual physical abuse does not, will not respond to traditional psychotherapies and medications, but there's a lot of Im implications because of that. And that really has to do with developmental trauma disorder. And which I really love um, looking at it that way. It depends on the developmental age that it occurred because at that developmental age, you may not succeed in finishing that developmental age. Therefore, you may see ways that kids will accommodate uh, to move forward, but you're also having a lot of neurological effects. But the most important thing, and I'm, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, but the most important thing is that you have the environmental insults cause demethylation or hypomethylation of genes. And one of those, for instance, is FKBP5. And when it's demethylated, what happens is it's responsible for producing the glucocorticoid receptors in your HPA axis. You don't have as many then. And so you can't respond to stress appropriately. You never get go into negative feedback 
you never settle down. And so a lot of the things that have been done is because we have to look more at what's going on with inflammatory genes that are turned on at that, that time. What effect does that have? And this is where complementary medicine and functional medicine really comes in. What else is going on that's preventing this brain from getting back to normal? Uh, not just what genes are being turned on or off, but what is the inflammatory response? What are the genes that are involved with inflammation? And so we actually are looking now at functional medicine techniques or sim techniques that despite the fact that you know, you've had a lot of childhood abuse or ACEs, um, they're working. And a couple of them have been EFT because it actually turns off the inflammatory cytokines or genes associated with it. Um, but there was a study with meditation that actually did show that meditation remethylated that gene. And I think that's where we're going. You know, the other piece of this is that when you're going to do an intervention, you always have to, and I can see this from all the work that I was uh, reviewing, if you're taking a technique and you don't adjust it to the developmental age at which the trauma occurred, you're probably not going to get a lot of success. However, there has been some studies with neurofeedback as well that has been used in PTSD with adults with history of ACEs and they have been able to turn it around. So it's another aspect of it that we may have to look at. 